Welcome back. Well, I am delighted that the Conservative Party of Canada is having another leadership race. It is no secret that I was a critic of Aaron O'Toole, not just because he didn't win, which of course is the main characteristic you look for in a politician, but because I don't think he was particularly conservative. And uh, I think one of the side effects of the trucker rebellion was that issue was forced and the Conservative caucus said goodbye to him. It was a bit of a miracle. Political accountability, I think. And the race is on. The starter pistol has been shot. The date, if I'm not mistaken, of the new leadership vote is in September 10th. Now, that feels like an eternity from now, but it's not too far away. I suppose they put it in the distance to get a chance to some outsiders to throw their hat in the ring. I see reports that Jean Charest, uh, the former Mulroney cabinet minister and then liberal premier of Quebec, is considering throwing his hat in the ring. Uh, Patrick Brown, the former Ontario PC leader, who's now the mayor of Brampton. Pierre Polyev has been actively campaigning. Uh, Roman Baber, the Ontario MPP who came out against lockdowns, announced his campaign last night. But one of our favorite people is throwing her hat in the ring. I'm talking about Dr. Leslyn Lewis, the MP for Haldeman Norfolk, who did so well in the last leadership campaign. What a delight to welcome her back to the show. Dr. Lewis, it's great to see you again. You can see I'm a fan and I don't even care who knows. I'm not hiding it. Great to see you again. I'm delighted that you're running in the leadership campaign. Tell me a little bit about your strategy, what you're going to emphasize as your issues. Uh, what do you hope to accomplish? Thanks for having me here, Ezra. So many people would ask, well, why are you doing this again? And to be honest with you, that not much has changed since last time. I'm still concerned about the direction of the com uh, country. I'm still concerned about our $1.3 trillion debt. Um, now with the war in between Russia and Ukraine, I'm concerned about some of our environmental policies that we have where we didn't develop our pipelines. And looking back, we can see that that was a grave mistake. And so I want to put forth a platform that will get Canadians on track, make sure that we're developing our, our, developing our natural resources and also that we also have a plan to protect the environment. I don't believe that those things are mutually exclusive. I also want to see people, uh, businesses have hope again. And as you know, 80% of all Canadians are employed by small businesses. And so we have to find a way to get them back, get hope back to them so that we could rebound out of COVID and get people employed, start building up revenues and pay down that debt. Those are interesting points. And of course, I, I agree with, uh, I mean, the pipelines. Canada could so obviously be a supplier of what I call ethical oil to the world. To We could displace Russia and OPEC nations. I, I, I believe in the economic issues. I think those are very important. But Dr. Lewis, one of the things that has come home to me over the last two years is that sometimes we take our civil liberties for granted. Because yes, the debt is important. And yes, pipelines are a solution. And Yes, getting small businesses, that's all important. You, you, can't, you, you can't buy groceries, you can't pay the rent if you don't have those things. But there are some other intangibles, civil liberties, freedom of speech, um, that I think the lockdowns of the last two years have really showed us the importance of those age-old principles. What do you have to say about freedom of speech and freedom of protest, the recent civil liberties inferno of the Emergencies Act. Can you talk a bit about those, not, not the pocketbook issues, but more the heartfelt issues a bit? Absolutely. I, I think it's very important that in a democracy that we uphold those, those liberties. And many Canadians and many immigrants came to this country because we were the beacon of hope of democracy. And when we have policies and practices that undermine that, it really erodes confidence. I was very, very concerned during the convoy protest because I was just two blocks away from Parliament. And so I had to walk through that protest every day. And I was able to speak to people, people who came all the way from BC, and they just wanted to be heard. And it's not as if they wanted to be there. Some of them had reached out to their MPs. They weren't getting answers. Some of them, they did whatever they could but they wanted answers as to why the government wasn't listening to them. And they came all the way to Parliament so that the, they could be
be heard by the government, and nobody wanted to listen. And it was very, very sad to see that uh, the approach that Justin Trudeau took, that he refused to meet with these individuals, and then he labeled them racist, demonized them. And th it was very, very disconcerting to see that how fragile our democracy is and, and our rights. And the evoking of the Emergencies Act was something that I also wasn't very pleased with because it suspended civil liberties. And people were very, very concerned that if this could be done so easily, what could the government do? Could they freeze our bank account for other issues that they disagree with us on? Yeah, I'm really worried about that, actually. It, it really accelerated cancel culture. Uh, it, cancel culture is bad enough when it's some woke mob on Twitter, but when the prime minister and the finance minister and the justice minister are directing it and there's no court process, then banks are going along with it. I think that's really terrifying. Uh, you know, I remember when you and I last met, it was actually on that very chilly day uh, on Parliament Hill at the trucker uh, protest. It was quite something. Not all conservative MPs or senators went down there. I think um, in, if I had to guess why, some disagreed with them, but more, I think, were scared of getting offside with the mainstream media. I, and I think that's, frankly, Aaron O'Toole, what happened to him, is I think maybe his instincts would have been sympathetic, but he was just too afraid to defy. I mean, the, the media was such a strong player in this drama. And they weren't just a, a neutral observer. They were a team. Let me ask you about that, because I think that should you become leader, obviously Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party machine are going to be your, your nominal opponent. But I think that in Canada, the toughest opponent for any conservative is the mainstream media. I think they mock. First, they ignore you. Then they mock you. Then they lie about you. And I think in the case of Aaron O'Toole, and I'm not asking for you to defend him or to condemn him, I'm just saying when I look at his tenure as leader, I think he was terrified of being devoured by the media, so he sought to please them. Um, how will you handle a hostile media who hate the very thought of a black woman being a conservative? They, they, I mean, I think they would hate you triple because of that. Yeah, I, I've seen them really misstate positions that I've had in the past and try to make it seem like if I was anti-LGBTQ+, which is really ridiculous because I worked as a refugee law, uh, worked in refugee law and defended people who were being persecuted because of their because they were a member of the LGBTQ uh, plus community. And so I defended those people um, in court. And so for I could see the media has even taken something like that and, and, and not recognize it. So I know that they're not my friends, but I'm not here to make friends with the media. I'm here to serve the Canadian people. And I, I understand the cost and I'm prepared to pay the cost of that. And as you said, that day, that cold day that I interviewed with you at, in front of the convoy, it was because I believed that these individuals came here and they needed to be heard. These are people that were traumatized, that were locked down for two years, that um, may be losing their jobs, may have had family members lose their jobs, and they wanted to be heard. And I am being paid by these individuals, some of them making $15, $20, $25 an hour, and uh, politicians are making hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour. So I don't understand why a politician wouldn't want to hear from their constituents. I think it's very, very important. It's the part of our democracy. And it's something that I felt that I had to do or else it, it would be meaningless, um, my job as a politician to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I want to ask you a, a question because I, I remember when you were running for the leadership last time, uh, you really took the party by storm. I think everyone was very excited, but there w was that one knock against you that you were fairly green. Um, mm -hmm. Now you've been in Parliament a couple of years. You've you've gotten to know the system a bit. You've been practicing, I guess, being a politician. Tell me what you think you've learned since the last go round. How have you gotten stronger? What what are you better at now? What did you maybe not know about two years ago that you think okay now I I understand it or now I'm working on that? Um, how are you different now than than two years ago? 
I don't know. Well, there's some good and there's some bad in that because I, I think that one thing I've learned is that when you're coming in, you just you want to see change, you want to see things move, and you realize sometimes that the wheels of politics turn really slowly. And so that was a little bit frustrating for me. But um, you learn how to work within the system, and that's something that I think that um, you you can only get that experience by being within the system. And so I'm glad that I, I do have that experience. I'm glad that I have a seat now. And I feel that the policies that I have now, um, they come from a place of authenticity and that hasn't changed. And I think that that's what's important to the people. That's what they want to see, that you're going to, you're going to stand up for them, even if it costs you, even if it's not popular. And they know that when you present a certain policy, you have the best interest of Canadians at heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a super fan and, and I'm not hiding it, but I want to ask you a tough question because that's what we do here at Rebel News. We, we don't hold back. And I want to ask you, and I, I don't know if it's fair, but in Canada, there's a tradition that if you're running for prime minister, you do have to speak both languages. And I know mm -hmm. that really limits uh, because most people grow up unilingual. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't pass that test. Um, what would you say to people who say, well, Leslie Lewis is great, but her French skills are not strong and a quarter of the country speaks French? What would you say to that? Yeah, I think it's very important that you speak French. And so I, I'm making an effort to do that. I have continued with my French studies. Uh, unfortunately, during the election, I took a little bit of time off because I really wanted to focus on the new writing. My writing had had a great MP, Diane Finley. She'd been there for 17 years. And so I felt a, a sense of vulnerability going in as a new person that they didn't know me. So I did take a few months off my French lessons, um, not doing it the way that I should have. But I'm very serious about it. And the people of Quebec, they just want to see that you're trying and that you are committed to learning it. And uh, to be honest with you, though, I, I feel that if there were a French person who couldn't communicate in English and it was a he was a great or she was a great candidate, I think that things are evolving to the point where people would accept that. For the first time, we've had we have a governor general who does not speak French, and I'm sure she's making efforts to speak French, and she has some unique qualities that she brings to the job. And so I think people would recognize those in me also, and also recognize that I'm a person who values education, so I'm going to make the best effort to continue to learn French. I want to ask you a question uh, on behalf of Canadians who have not been vaccinated for whatever reason. Perhaps it was a religious reason, perhaps it was a medical decision they made, perhaps they, they're hesitant and they, they've just weighed the odds and the risks for whatever reason, they made that choice. Um, in most places, vaccine mandates are coming down, although some governments still require them to work there. But in Canada, you still can't get on an airplane or a train or a ferry uh, if you're unvaxxed. It's almost like there's a no-fly list for, for millions of Canadians. And of course, there's the possibility that other lockdown restrictions can be brought back in. They've been brought back in before. What would you say to Canadians who are, are glad that things seem to be loosening up, but it's, we're still not out of it yet? Do you have a message to Canadians who are unvaxxed for what you might do for them? Well, I think we have to look at what's happening around the world. And around the world, we're seeing that the mandates are being removed. And throughout this pandemic, we've heard over and over, trust the science, trust the medical officers of health. And the medical officers of health across the country are saying that it's time to remove the mandates. And they've done so in, in most of the provinces. So I think it's time that the federal government does put a plan on the table that will end the mandate. Right now, it's, it's just a means of discriminating against those who are not vaccinated because we know that we have other means of accommodation we can test the unvaccinated uh, to have an increased level of security. And so the prohibition for them not being able to get on a plane or um, a, a, a train, et cetera, I think that it's just, um, it's outdated. I, I don't think it's necessary. And I think that the government needs to 
follow the science uh, and look at what other jurisdictions are doing and look at what the, the provinces are doing and, and get up to speed and end and, and those mandates. Do you think people who were fired over the last year because they didn't get jabbed and now the mandates have been removed, do you think they should be, especially in the public sector, do you think they should be invited back to work? Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I never believe that people should have been fired because they are unvaccinated for a medical choice. We've always had medical freedoms in this country. And especially when the science came out that um, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you could still spread and, and um, contract COVID. Uh, I think that at that point in time, the policy should have reflected that. And it, it's very important for us to look at personal responsibility. I think every individual should take responsibility for themselves to do whatever they can to protect themselves, protect their family, and minimize the strain on, on our healthcare system. But I also believe in informed consent, and I believe in um, medical privacy, and I also believe that people need to make these decisions in accordance with their doctor, and they need informed consent to make their decisions. And I don't believe that people should have been fired for a medical choice. Uh, what's a website that people can learn more about you and if they want to sign up to be a part of this, uh, where can they get more info? LeslinLewis.ca. And all the info that you'll need is there, how to take out a membership, because you have to be a member to vote. And um, everything that you'll need to be a member and also to donate is on the site. So look forward to Seeing you all, um, I will be doing tours and small group meetings, and I hope to meet some of you in person. Well, that's great. I really appreciate you stopping by. It was a pleasure to have you in the last campaign. I remember that we were one of your very first stops, and uh, yes. it was great to meet you that day. And we've uh, been following your career ever since. And uh, I'm delighted that you're in the race. LeslinLewis.ca is the website. Great to see you, and good luck out there. Okay, thank you, Ezra. Nice seeing you again. All right, you too. There you okay. have it, Leslie Lewis, candidate for the Conservative Party of Canada. Stay with us.